Um, all right, can I, should we talk about modules? Yeah, yeah, definitely. He said, he said not at all over eagerly. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming. I'm excited to talk about modules today. I, um, so full disclosure, I am not a, you know, shiny expert, but I have been trying to using it about the same time as this book club has been running. I've been teaching myself shiny. And I like taught myself by like diving into this chapter and reading it five times. So when I, I like volunteered to, to talk about this one, as soon as I heard that Russ was still looking for people. So uh, last week, was it already last week, maybe it was more than, slightly more than that. I, uh, one of my jobs is I run this training program for grad students. And the, together with some of these students, I taught a two day workshop on Shiny. So rather than diving into the chapter, I wanted to show you sort of two teaching examples that we used in our workshop where we have the same app, which is a very nice app written by one of our students. And uh, I rewrote it in, in Golem actually, but the point is that I rewrote it with modules. So it might be a nice like before or after. And as soon as I get it set up to put the PR into the course notes, I'll, I'll link to these two things here, but I can also drop links to them into the Slack if you wanna check them out. Uh, before I execute that. So here's the original. I'm going to show them on my screen in just a second. Here's the original. Can I chat? Yes. Here's the original written by graduate student Jake Lawler, a student at McGill University here in Montreal, Canada, where I also am. And here is my rendition in Golem. Coming up. There it is. So I'm just gonna share my screen and look at the source code, look at the app and talk about why I think modules are cool. And then we'll like look at the text in the chapter. How does that sound? That was my plan. Okay. Um, when I click on your link, it's yeah. I get a 404. When you click on my link, you get a 404? The second yeah, one by us too? It shouldn't be, why would it be? Huh. Jake Lauer. It 100% is private. Sorry, let me fix that right now. Live on recording uh, oh because there's no reason for it to be private. That was just <laughs> an accident. Uh, yeah. One sec. Um, but you can you can uh, download and look at Jake's very nice one while, while you wait. Yeah. Uh, it's It makes a it's tiny 2 data set. It's volcanoes. Um, Change, it's called visibility, isn't it? Yeah, we're looking at and visualizing the name of volcanoes of the world. Hey, it is revealed now publicly, right. the golden <laughs> version of the exact same thing. Sorry about that. Thank you very much for, uh, for encouraging me. Okay, let's take a look at Jake's, the guts of Jake's uh, creation first. So Jake, talented modern R programmer, uh, has created this thing. It's using the Shiny dashboard. I don't know if we've covered that in the discussion group. I'm sorry, I had conflicts the last two what? weeks. No, I don't think we have. Shiny uh, dashboard is just a, you know, whatever. It, it sets you up with the one column and the other column of the appropriate widths and it looks kind of nice and it defaults to this blue, bootstrap blue. Um, but it works just like your Shiny apps that you're familiar with, uh, Jake has managed to fancy it up with sort of like some emoji, you know, and so on. But essentially we have, we have two things going on here. We have um, sort of three, in fact, three boxes on the dashboard that each do a separate thing. So here I can choose which group of volcanoes to see according to like the volcano category, Strata Volcano Shield, Caldera and so on. I can click off one and the dots disappear off the map. The, uh, I also have, at the same time, I have this, uh, this stacked bar chart down here that shows the relative frequencies in different parts of the world and have the same information visually on the map. I have the dots on the map. So three boxes, three, three ideas. The code for this thing is something that we're, used, we're all used to seeing by now. Uh, here's, this, here's Jake's server function. It sources in libraries in the packages that we're, we're gonna use. Uh, you're reading the data, you have the, some dplyr code here to sort of manipulate it a tiny little bit. And then down here is the interesting part, you have a reactive value, that is the volcanoes which are selected. So the main user input is this first box over here, the selection criteria. That's all the user can do really in this simple app. So the user is here clicking on the type of volcano, uh, it's taking that input and it's gonna spit out 
the selected volcano. And then it's then we have two things that are going to sort of ingest the selected volcano filtered data set and use it. One, the continent plot. So here's a render plot and the GG plot inside of it. And here, uh, going down here, we have the volcano. Um, sorry, I'm wrong. This is the stack bar plot. This is the stack bar plot down here. Um, and this is the, and the map is the leaflet map down here. Render leaflets, a rendered leaflet map. So this is not about like the, how to use, how to use leaflet or anything like this, uh, so much as it is about how to, um, how to break things down into modules, right? That's the theme of the day. So as you can see, Jake's server file, and I, no disrespect, I just copied his code directly because it's really, it's excellent. It's 185 longs, uh, lines long, it has, plotting code, it has uh, reactivity. And you have to, if you look through it, you can see where things are going. So here you see, uh, let's see if we can find it. We have the volcano map that goes in and it actually is gonna get updated with leaflet proxy down here using the selected volcanoes reactive that came out of this first box. So the reactive map of this briefly is like, I'm clicking on this somewhere. I'm getting out a reactive value that is the, a shorter data frame filtered for just the rows that I checked off. That filtered data frame gets used in two places, that reactive value used in two places, once for the black plot, once for the map. All happening at once in this long script-like 185 line long thing. Uh, any questions or comments on that before I pop to my rewrite of the same thing? This, notice it looks like they got pretty good comments in there. There were yeah. at least like liberal use of a good, you know, good use of comments a lot, which is nice. True. I, I hard agree. And uh, Jake also has a really nice commenting style where he's like, and the, you can also see that this is like, we're not going to talk about this it's a side issue, but it's adapted for pedagogy where like students were asked to put something into it at a specific place. So mm -hmm. he like tried to signpost this in comments. Um, yeah, I, I chose to rewrite this because it's very, it's already very clear code that doesn't even really need modules to make it better. Hmm. Uh, but, um, but you can kind of see the contrast, I think, a bit more clearly yeah. for that. So here's my attempt at the exact same thing. Um, let me run it. So this is, this is not, again, there's like unrelated to modules is Golem, but this happens to be Golem. Uh, and so I guess we're to, next week is the great R package shiny debate. Uh, so let's just, maybe we can defer that or preview it later. But um, suppose that I just wanted to run this app. Oh, does anyone else's R Studio really slow down when you're sharing your screen? It happens to me a lot. So bear with me. Uh, we're going to do the Golem. We're going to run run dev, and it's going to pop up. Oh, hopefully, the exact same. Exact same appearance. Yeah, it looks the same, it works the same. But let's look at my server code. Instead of 185 longs, it's li lines long, it is 22 lines long. It is just three modules. So each one of Jake's boxes can be decomposed into a simple idea, what goes in and what comes out. So modules take your app and they break it into tiny sections. If you can think of each part of the app as a little box, of like, for example, in the selection criteria box, and it worked out beautifully in Jake's app because uh, it's already divided into visual boxes. So here, what goes in, a user click. What comes out, a data frame. Down here, volcanoes by continent. What goes in, a data frame. What comes out, a bar chart. Likewise, the map, which you can't see in my R studio right now, but you've already seen, is what goes in, the filtered data frame. What comes out, a map. So you define these inputs and outputs, and then your app code becomes very, very simple. So here, for example, is a module uh, where you select the volcano. So let's look at it. This is what it looks like. So here, all the code that would have been in Jake's server function is now sort of compressed into a much shorter R script, much easier to get your head around, um, all in a separate place. So here's the UI for the user inter interface. That's the checkbox group. And here, is the server. And so that just uses that input to filter the data frame. Uh, so 
that is the, that's like the high level. We'll talk about the syntax. We'll talk about namespaces and all that stuff in a second. But that is the, one of the main payoffs for me is that the server function becomes tiny. The uh, UI similarly becomes tiny. And you have, see, I'm just saying where the U UI of each of these modules goes inside the box that is in the shiny dashboard. And then you can sort of practice, develop your sections of your app separately. What do you think? <laughs> the, uh, I hope everyone can see this on their own screens now. If you, I hope my link is working mm -hmm. for everyone yeah. who chooses to follow it up. The, uh, I'm just going to show one more thing before we start talking about what Hadley has to say. Uh, the thing that I love about modules is that I can actually, you can act, because they are tiny bits of the app, you can actually run them on their own outside of the large app to generate uh, an ugly but functional baby sub app and check to make sure that it works. So here I'm just practicing whether or not the, um, the yeah, I'm, I'm loading the data. I'm seeing if you can take a, uh, a subset of the data frame and plot it properly or make it, I'm just here make, making a table. So here the, uh, maybe this is not the best example. Let me find a simpler one. The Volcano Select, okay. We were just talking about the Volcano Select UI and output. So here is a simple example. I'm gonna make a little baby shiny app. Here's the UI, it's just this tiny bit. It's the selector UI for my module and it outputs a table. And down here, the server function simply reads in the data, passes it into the module server function, the, the, the server component of that module. And then it's gonna, that module spits out a reactive, the selected data, remember the, the shortened rows of the data corresponding to what you clicked on. And then it simply puts it into a render table so I can look at it. So if I run all this, if I run all this, You definitely have to actually, this is another event. This is like, I don't mean to like sell, sell the discussion early, Russ, but one of the advantages of our packages in um, uh, at Goldem is that you get all the, all the cool advantages of our package development. So here uh, you have a very simple like checkbox group. I can click one and it's gonna spit up the, uh, it's gonna spit up the volcanoes that fit that filtering term. So I can just check to make sure, oh yeah, this part of the app works. I can, the user can click on the volcano types and sure enough, the right table comes out. All right, so hey, if how I go- How did you get this again? Sorry, Sorry. I, I, I think, I, think I, uh, I missed it, how you got to this viewer, like this view of that. Oh, right, sure. So, so, so once again, like the, um, let me hop back over here to the module. So in the module, you define like the, the uh, uh, a UI and a server side of just the module, mm -hmm. a miniature app. So it looks just like the regular code that we're used to seeing with a few things like this NS thing is going on. Um, but then you can create a sort of, uh, I'm gonna close this because that's not the one, this. Then you can create a sort of miniature app. So this is the whole script right here. I'm gonna make it big so it doesn't seem like it goes off the screen. It's just a, a testing script, you know, as if I was mm -hmm. testing our package. But the key part is here that I've selected. You're just making a miniature UI that only uses the module UI and making a miniature server that only uses the module server and sort of whatever else you need around it. Maybe you have to read in data or spit out some output so that you can see that it works. Uh, and then you run it and then you run it with Shiny App and it will just make a tiny Shiny App of the module part of your bigger app so that you can see, you can play with it, see that it works, develop it so and so on. It like runs in the context of test that it runs it spins up an interactive session for your little app. Yes, yeah, so, yeah. Because so I don't know, because so it says skip if not interactive, that's the condition. That's a very good, that's a very good uh, point. So this is, I mean, this is sort of aside from this, the, su the subject of modules. This is oh, if you okay. decide to go the golem route, you're offered the chance to like test your functions and test your modules inside an R package testing framework, which is like test that in this case. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't actually want to test to see if my module works, but that's the, this is the place where we put the tests. I don't want to test it like whenever I push to GitHub, I don't want Travis to go see if it can run my Shiny app. That's, gonna, that's not gonna work. 
because uh, it's just something you test with your eyes. But still, the tests go in this place. So I just want to be able to run my, my tests, but I don't want it every time I run my tests, like, I want to like test the functions and things like that. I don't want to test this module. So it, it says skip if not interactive. So it, it won't, there's no risk of it running when the tests run in a non-interactive way. Does that make sense? Mm, yeah. So here I can just like, I can just run this test manually and it's not, so I had it like, I had this testing script like in my R scripts below and that confused a collaborator because he thought this was part of the module. And I was like, no, that's just testing code, ignore it. Pay no attention, so I put it over here. But that's, let's leave that, let's leave the testing framework aside and just consider that modules are handy because they break up your code, but also because you can test it, play with it separately. Uh, so I, I mean, I didn't mean to take up like two thirds of the time discussing those examples, but I just thought that would be a cool, like, um, yeah. uh, sort of summary of why it's useful and let's see a before after in a more complex place. I was also thinking we could talk about what is discussed in the chapter. Um, does anybody have any other kind of comments or things that we want to talk about before we, we dive into going through what Hadley has to say? Yeah. So. I think, I, I don't remember if you mentioned, I might have missed it. One of the things I think benefits of modules is that you have both the UI and the server for that module in the same file. Right? So you go to the same place to edit that module. It's not like you have to search through, these are all my UI files, or these are all my server files. I found it it's, can be, it makes it a lot simpler. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Andrew. Um, I feel like uh, I don't have a very good working memory. I can't really can't picture a big complex app structure. It stresses me out. So <laughs> when I can just whittle it down to like a couple of inputs and outputs, then I find I have a much easier time. Um, yeah, just yeah. feeling then I can know what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. You can focus on that one little thing without having to worry about trying to the overhead of trying to remember where all everything the separate components live. Yeah. Yeah, Colin once said that now he feels like he can't write shiny apps without thinking in modules, and it's true. Uh, and so, what the let's talk about like the actual syntax, shall we? And like look at Hadley's. I just I'd like to talk about just his first two examples: the histogram, the simple histogram, and then the the fancier histogram app that he builds in the chapter. And then, I mean, I, I don't know if we have time or inclination to talk about things like the wizard that he introduces, but it's really all the same core concept, right? So I have some crude notes here that will shortly go on the book club website. Um, but here, wait, I do. Here they are. So sort of the learning objectives of this chapter are uh, really just sort of explaining how to use modules and why they're interesting and sort of demonstrating some of the concept, like the conceptual shift that has to happen. Uh, when you have modules, when you're breaking your UI into chunks and then also when you're breaking it into chunks that don't generate a user output, but that generate a reactive value that other things are gonna sort of consume and maybe they're the ones that make the user output. Um, oh, I'd also add that one of the major benefits to modules is that you can reuse them. So if you have a specific kind of like, you know, leaflet map that is really useful for your work or whatever, that's a personal example for my own work, but maybe there are other ones for you. Uh, you would like, you could create a module and put it in an R package or something and actually use that in different parts of your projects so that you have always the same and you don't have to reduplicate this code every single time that you want to use it. So it's like, it, it makes your apps modular. I don't need to um, belabor that too much. Uh, the, maybe we'll get back to this, but let's look at the histogram thing. So this is Hadley's, uh, this is Hadley's work, the, like the first example that we look at in this chapter. So I should have like, Yeah. So this is a simple, um, it's a simple function to take just empty cars and it's going to make a histogram of a column in that data frame. So I can choose the column and 
sure enough, I get a histogram. Yeah, I can tweak the bin argument of it. And so uh, Hadley transforms that. Hadley transforms that into a, a module by separating out the two parts of it. It just as a way of introducing the module syntax. So it transforms this app up here, which is all yeah. one, like two guys? chunks of UI and server, uh, to this guy down here. So we have histogram UI, outputs this tag list. As Hadley says in the chapter, the tag list is just like an unstructured sequence of HTML things that's up to the user to place in a nice configuration, like a fluid row or column or whatever, flex dashboard, shiny dashboard, whatever you're doing. Uh, this is the syntax for doing this thing called the namespace, which is a major part of what makes modules interesting. So sometimes you might, you might want to have many, many plots in your adorable cat. Uh, you might, might have many, many plots, for example, in your app, and you'll find yourself doing things like plot dash one, plot dash results or whatever, you know, giving them all names. Uh, so modules introduced you something called namespacing, which just means like there's a space in which a name is applied. And if you have multiple modules inside the modules, you can call the plot just by a simple name like plot. And it's because the modules have got different IDs, it doesn't affect, they don't collide, there's no confusion happening. So the way we do that is this thing, simply NS for namespace, ID, which is the argument to the module function, and then the name of the actual element. So this is the only thing that's being used sort of inside the module to tell it what is the name of the value that's being selected. What's the, where to find it in the input list. So I don't think I explained that terribly well, but um, let's, we can, we can look and see that this, excuse me, this right here, uh, app has the exact same impact, input, or rather exact same result. as the previous one. So it looks just the same. Now, I just want to share with you like the thing that I struggled with enormously when you when I was first learning modules is exactly the spoiler plate look here like here it's what's on the screen right now. Here I have NS ID and then var. And then down here, I have input dollar sign var. So how does it know? It's because the histogram, the module server syntax is like this doubly nested function. You see, it's got this module server uh, creates an anonymous function that runs inside of histogram server here. So, and the histogram server is the one that gets the ID there. That's gonna say, okay, this part matches the UI part. And then it's going to actually actually look for an, an element of the input that is not just var, but var for that ID. But you can't see that. That's invisible. That's happening because of the structure of the module function and because module server is doing that work for you. So here I'm using dollar sign var, and here I'm using quotation mark var inside this NS thing, but you have to do both of those to make it work. So if, and the tricky thing about modules is that it's both useful and terrible that the, um, the two parts of the module don't know that they go together. Like you wrote them together, they sit next to each other in the code, they have the same name, but they don't know that they truly belong together until you give them the same ID, hist1 in this case. So if I change this to hist99, and try and try to run this app here, this guy. It'll run, but will I get a histogram? No, because now the part of the server that's generating my histogram doesn't know. It's waiting for something called hist 99 bar, which will never come because there's nothing in the UI to generate something called hist99-var. The UI is generating something called hist1-var, 
and the server is not listening for that. So that's why the two parts aren't functioning. So some, and it's frustratingly not an error, it's perfectly valid to have your app listen for an input that doesn't, it's never gonna be created. Leila, mm -hmm. what do you think? Great. I, I, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what I think. Um, so I, I guess now I know to make sure to keep my ID name for his, like the <laughs> Instagram server, like the Instagram. I have to put you down, little girl. Okay, sorry. Hashtag our cat ladies. <laughs> yeah, I am a cat lady. So, um, yeah, so I'm um, like talking about, and I think you lost me to the namespace. We had to create a tag list of HTML, um, like the widgets, and then, but then put their IDs in a namespace and then call those IDs in their own. Like in the server, so like when you when you showed the server, it had like in bracket bracket in hit dollar sign the like the ID of the widget, but the app the the it, if the and server and the UI portion of module don't have the same. ID, then they won't find each other. And I, I think what I'm, where I'm getting lost is that there's so many IDs. So yes, where, <laughs> like yeah, how, it, where do you name them? Yeah, it's a bit like um, it's a bit like how the two Andrews in the Zoom are not going to get confused with each other because one is Andrew Bates and the other is Andrew McDonald. Like we, the name Andrew is namespaced inside the last name environment or whatever the term is right like like the 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 module id is like mcdonald uh for me and bates for the other the other person who i hope is still here oh yes there he is andrew sound off okay so it's like that right but inside that namespace you can safely use andrew except you can't because andrew mcdonald's an extremely common name um but, uh, so here, this might help. Um, I'm just going to jump down to the other work example where Hadley builds up this sort of three module, uh, histogram. I just wanted to show this one part of it because I think it's kind of, I think it's, it's helpful to like demystify this ID thing. Here is simply like the, the UI, the output part, uh, where you just get the tag list of like, um, yeah, it's just the tag list of like the user chooses how many bins go in and then you also plot the histogram. That's all that happens. We're not even talking about the server. So if you just run histogram output and for the for FF or like FUBAR or something like that, like some kind of whatever output name, you can see that like the, uh, the IDs here, input ID, we called it bins, but all that NS is doing, fancy, fancy computer standard thing, namespacing, all the stuff, it's just paste zero. All it does is put foobar dash in front of it. So the computer knows to be like the server is going to be looking for foobar dash bins, not just bins, which means the, the foobar here is like McDonald or Bates. Yeah. Like, like the group that this thing falls into. And foobar hist is what comes out. So the server side will have to be called with foobar as well, so that that part knows to go looking for those inputs. Are you, is it like essentially creating like classes in a sense? Because like, look at, okay, look at your, your, your class of shiny input container. Within that, there's a label and it's called foobar bins label. And then you have a, within, within that div, and then a new div is great, getting created for your histogram, but preceded by a foobar. So. Sure. I, yes, I, I think I think you could kind of think of these as dollar store classes, you know, as like very a very crude way of creating classes 
without all the infrastructure of like actually a real class-based system. Remember in the, one of the earlier chapters, Hadley was talking about how he might have done this with R6 classes had this been done a few years earlier. Mm -hmm. Because uh, there is something about classes that seems to be reactive and shiny. Uh, I think with the IDs, the, the, one way to think about it too is like within the module, you have sort of like the generic name, like bins or whatever. But let's say you wanted to have, let's say your, your histogram module took any sort of data set, right? And you had two data sets in your, in your bigger app. Then you could say like data set one histogram, data set two histogram. So th those are like your more general, like your, your, your more specific names, I guess. So within, in, within the module, it's kind of general um, in terms of like, kind of like parameter names. But when, when you call that module, you'll give it, you could give it like a name that's more specific to the app as a whole. I, I don't know if that helps, so that might be more confusing. Should we, um, should we do one? like live on recording or should, would that be fun and useful? Fun for us. I remember you put your foot in your mouth. I always find Look, myself uh, when I try and live, live code, something always comes out unexpected. I know, especially when it's unplanned, but I feel like this is a safe space. I feel like I know you all really well. By <laughs> so Russ can edit this in post-production, right? <laughs> so let's do it. Let's, let's just take uh, Hadley's initial Shiny app and rewrite it. Is this the one that, yeah, this is the, this is like his default one. Let's like rewrite it in modules. So just doing like the very beginning thing in the chapter, which is like not even really worthwhile to do in modules because it's just a simple app already. But um, maybe that feels like something, like a good example. I'll just do this in a totally fresh script. So, I, don't, I also don't want to clutter the main repo with all the with all these different things, but uh, okay. So Hadley, so this is where another point of departure. Hadley suggests that you actually create an RStudio snippet to. It's one of the exercises. It's like the fourth exercise in the in the intro section. He's like, make a snippet to do the module, but being the uh, you know irrepressible golem fan that I am. I want to use the golem function to do it, but you can do it both ways. <laughs> so once again, like we got the select input, we got the numeric input, we got the flat output. The server does nothing. It just takes empty cars, looks for the input variable. Um, that's going to be a reactive value. And it spits out a histogram. Um, so it renders plot, hist, the data as a reactive and so on. Uh, I guess you didn't even need to do the reactive. You could have put empty cars input var in there. So um, is that going to work? It works only because I didn't, sorry, do. All right, now let's see if we can just do this thing in, uh, in modules. So first I'm going to generate like a module template because I personally can never remember what they are. This is where the snippets come in. Mm. Uh, this is, I did this, I, I made one of these, I baked one of these before filming the show today. Uh, but I'm going to try and remember how I did that. Module, module template. I put these in the notes that I will submit a pull request for. But Golem has a module template function. You can make an RStudio snippet, but honestly, this works just fine. We're going to call that histo histogram, and the path is going to be sure histogram that I. Unfortunately, you have to, this, this particular way of doing it in, involves you actually writing export, which is like not relevant to that side in our package, but we'll, we'll edit that later. So we have this thing here, uh, this other R script, histogram.r, which is gonna give us the, a very, very simple, I'm just gonna delete all the boilerplate. This if you want to document it inside your R package with mm -hmm. Proxygen 2, which is really nice, but you know, let's just, let's just keep it simple for today. Um, uh, that part is helpful, so I'll keep it. So this is all the boilerplate of Golem. So um, it's basically the exact same thing that Hadley discusses in the chapter. One small variation is they create another function namespace for the ID. So you don't have to, it saves you a tiny bit of type. You have to type ID column every, ID comma, just type N namespace every time. Yeah. Uh, so let's see what happens with our function here. We've got the select input variable and the names, empty cars. 
So we're going to go select input. Uh, we need the ID, so we have to namespace it. And what do we what, what do we call this one? Vars, maybe. And then, and then this part is the choices. How did we do that before? Just just hop them back and forth. Names, empty cards, of course. Okay. And down here in the server, we need to use that to subset empty cars. So we can do what, um, well, we can make it really simple for now. Just go like this. We could go So you even have to call it in the session? Yeah. You have to yes. Like session yeah. namespace? So this. Hey, the namespace uh, lives in the session? Maybe some, this is one of the things that I wanted to discuss here today. Um, I'm not exactly sure. The session, this, this doesn't actually get used explicitly, no. at least not when I write modules, but perhaps someone else can speak to what it actually does. Because like, it says session dollar sign NS. So does the se so the session hold a namespace that you're assigning it to NS? I think my sense is that this sort of thing, this up here, as well as the ID, the whole module, the whole server being a, a function of ID, um, and then this thing in here, which we, which we dare not touch, uh, is important in order because this input var doesn't make a lot of sense. There's no input called, first of all, I spelled that wrong. It's called vars with an S up here. They, the input var, like we saw before, after it goes through NS, it comes out like whatever you name the ID like foobar or my histogram or whatever, dash bar. So input is not gonna, you have to input, the input list element that gets used here has to match whatever the ID is. And I suspect that this is part of the machinery that does that. That's my understanding. Does anybody else understand that in more, with more clarity? Or maybe that this isn't the session for the entire app, but this is a session for just the server, the module server, and it's like its own isolated session. Instead of what our typical what we're used to in our shiny apps where your server function has a session and that from which you can call your yes. environmental, like your user information, for example, and things like that. That sounds, that sounds right to me. <laughs> the um, and just right okay. So now we can make a very very simple. Um, oops, I'm on the wrong shiny. App. Okay, here we are. Now we can make a very simple like shiny app down here for the UI. I'm just going to use fluid page, and uh, it's just simply going to be the the. Uh, Golem wants to help you by reminding you what gets copied where to be copied to the UI. Boom. And then here, server. So you have to call the module server inside a server, otherwise it won't work at all. Uh, so this part is, yeah, you just call the module inside the server. Similarly, to be copied to the server here. So just as we do before, we function input, output, like so. Let's see if it works. It was something in your live code. All right, I got my UI part, but I didn't get my, oh, do you know why? I forgot to render the table output. Sorry. So here's, <laughs> here in the, I have output this table thing, but I don't have any user out UI thing that corresponds to it. So I'm going to do a table output, right? 
table output, and then once again, ns table, spelling table correctly. Separate with a comma. Everyone happy with me now? There. Mm -hmm. All right, so now it's very, very, like it's very crude. I'm just getting the numeric column that I have. But this hopefully demonstrates like the workflow anyway of, yeah. uh, of generating a module boilerplate using a helper function or a snippet as Hadley has you do. And just sort of like connecting them together with this ID thing and testing it out. And that can be like your development process for your shiny modules. I um, had a look on GitHub for any um, source code that used the session dollar NS um, thing yeah. to, to, to work out what would be the typical use case. And a few of them are, if you have a server function that generates the UI, mm. it has to know the name of the namespace that it should pass into that UI so that it can, you know, be, be used. But to be honest, otherwise, I, I haven't found any reason to have the namespace mm -hmm. variable av available in the, the, the server function. But that yeah. kind of makes sense. Like, what would happen if you commented out line 12? Let's would try. Let's give it and try. I love this. It seems to work fine. Could we, uh, what is, what is the, like, what, what is, is it? Happening? Okay. So, do you anything? Mm. Function ID if length ID is zero return and it's free if, if and this prefix is a return ID. So what are uh does it exist? Should it even be using isolate here? Yeah, it exists. That's a thing. I think you would typically use it as a function, though. So maybe you have to evaluate. Yeah, sorry. No, no. Really typically, use as a function, like so. Hmm. So you did ns ff. You haven't defined ff. No, it's so like uh, yeah. It's just creating. It's just creating the. The namespace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, but this is what it did on the server side of things. I'm not sure if session, I guess it like it brings you in the function that we defined. You know what? Here's an interesting thing. What if we um uh I never it never occurred to me to run these kinds of experiments before. Would this do anything if that was commented out? This session, does this small case NS appear only because we did this up here? That's what I want to know. Mm. Well, you UI functional fail, won't it? Not before it generates this. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see. Huh, no, it's still there. It's not as simple as that. I guess, I mean, this is useful, I suppose, also, like, I think in the case of, like, dynamic UIs, like, if I wanted to make a new, mm -hmm. a new UI that had all kinds of things in it, but I wanted that new UI to know that it belonged to the namespace of the server, right. I don't know that is too fancy um, for me. But I think that the, the one thing we haven't mentioned about this, like ways of getting things with modules is to make modules that accept arguments. Like when you are writing this part here, and Hadley has some examples of this in this chapter, when you are writing this part right here, you can add an argument here that will affect the way the module works. So for example, in the, in the text, uh, there is the, let me find it in the histogram app. You're passing in, yeah. You're passing in, for example, okay, this is the server side, but it's still it's the same same um, same kind of behavior. Uh, you're setting a default value for something called filter, uh, and then it's sort of letting the user of the module, like when you program it into your app or whatever, determine how it behaves. 
or you can also, um, yeah, here, this one right here, this is the, another example from the chapter where there's something going in called, the, called data chosen, which is the reactive value of the data set that was selected by the user when they're picking their data set. So this, is, uh, this has to be a reactive value and it gets used inside it's, it's the reactive value for observe event and for the choices in the dropdown menu that are generated by this part of the server. So I do the same thing in my, in my Golem app where you are like accepting the reactive value of the filtered volcano data set to go into the data sets. And you can also have modules return reactive. So this one returns the reactive value of the input data set, the column that they selected and uh, the data that they, so that they chose. And that would be passed in to other modules. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the idea. Wait, so, okay. So outside of the Gollum context, what does the directory look, what does your directory look like? Because you have your Shiny app, right? Your normal directory for your Shiny app, which includes your app.r, maybe a global, and like a www folder. Mm -hmm. And then, but like, now do you have a modules folder that, or an R folder? Like what is that, what does that skeleton look like? I'm really, how do you I'm, reference them? I'm really happy you asked that because I have, I have an example. I feel like I like, again, like a cooking show cook. Like I have this pre pre prepared before the show today. Um, let me see if I can find it very mm, quick. Tastes so delicious. <laughs> Always gonna taste so uh, delicious. <laughs> So you can, you've got a couple options. One that I like is just with a, you can still do the, your one script shiny app with modules. There's no conflict between the two things. So here is an example of one. Uh, I hope that it works. We'll see. Um, here is an example of one that I wrote to do like some uh, statistical rant that I love to do that I won't repeat for you right now. But it's like, uh, you know, it has a simple function. It has, this is a module right here to generate the, the UI part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and here is a module to do the server side function, you know, with re reactive, got some plots, not really important right now. It does things, it makes plots. And here's the server. It simply is putting, plugging the two things in exactly like the test app that I just wrote, up, they live coded. Um, and then you run the thing. So if I source the whole script, it, I just get my app. So the app is just broken down into functions, right. modules, you know, server UI, uh, that's it. But like the, the overall, the overarching goal, like purpose of modules is so that they can be reused. That's why like the package, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that like, you know, with packages and stuff. So if they're all just sitting in a app and a single page app, like, like this one, mm -hmm. then you would have, you wouldn't be able to, Call it That's another right. app if you needed that. So if you do the, so if you you, you said like setting goal on the side. So if you if you set goal on the side, you would just like your modules are just functions. Well, there are a pair of functions, um, mm -hmm. that don't know that they go together until they get that same ID argument. But you know they're mm -hmm. written together, and so you just have that R script probably as Andrew said with the UI and the server together. And that would go into an R package and you would export the two parts of the module, like exported functions okay. from an R package. And then people would just be like Layla's package, colon, colon, UI and the server and the UI yeah. part and so on in the server. Hey, this is probably the motivation for the packages part, because if, if you're like building shiny apps and you're constantly freaking doing the same exact thing, just with like a different interface, and mm -hmm. different data, this is where you would export the modules out of a package and be like, I need to do the same freaking histogram every every other day. Yeah. Hence, put it in a package and yeah. distribute it internally or something like this. Exactly. Yeah. And it's it's sort of like, I mean, to Russ's point, you don't need to put your Shiny app in a package to do this. You could have regularly, yeah. you know, regularly program Shiny apps. <laughs> that just happen to use modules that are carried around in some package, but the package itself is not a shiny app. It just carries around the module functions, yeah. like any functions. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't get that either. But I definitely understand. <laughs> but I definitely understand having the modules in a package, but not in a, a shiny app. Uh, yeah, no, I don't get that. 
Well, I guess that's next week, eh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I, I can see that yeah. it, the, the modules, the benefit of modules isn't solely that they're reusable. But it's also that you can test them. It's also that you can work on a amount of code that you can, with full sanity, hold in your brain at once. Mm -hmm. um, and that in itself, being able to partition a, a larger app into small, understandable components is as important, and, and, and certainly with testing and things like that, is as important as being able to reuse things because, I don't know, it's very hard to reuse things if you can't um, find them. <laughs> but, um, Fair yeah, uh, I, but I don't know. I mean, I, I, I have no problem with the package structure. I just find that the, aside from Gollum's way of doing it, that there's little um, um, guidance on how to structure that package. Yeah. Whereas if you have the shiny app and it's app.r and you are sorry, whatever it is, app.r and so server.r and mm. ui.r at the top level and an r subdirectory that yeah. contains all your functions and modules and things like that you still get access to the testing machinery and things like that um and it anyway it just it's just a lot easier to uh to manage to it, it, in my brain at least um, yeah, no, I agree. I also like sorry, being called a every plot, plot and not uh, get in trouble ever. <laughs> there's, something, there's something encouraging about not having to think up creative names for all my plots all the time. <laughs> um, that's it. That's all I, I had. I'll, I'll submit the pull request later. And uh, Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you so that's... much for the chance. To no, no, here. thanks to you. No, that, that was great. Okay. Okay. All right, then, everyone, I think we'll head off. Uh, okay. all right. Yeah, thanks again. <laughs> we'll see you all later. And, um, and next week is packages. Yeah. Right on. Cool. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Andrew. Cheers. <laughs>